the new pattern of examination which was introduced about two to three years back in the practical of uh, uh, orthopedics so the OSCE pattern so I think a pulsar needs no introduction so over to you sir good evening dr john mukhopadhyay and dr janki uh, you had an excellent uh, program which is going on throughout the country for the postgraduates so without uh, without wastage of time i'm just uh, starting my program today this oski all of you know the oski which is basically it is the test of uh, knowledge that is the cognitive skill the psychomotor skill and the affective skill of the students most of the commonly it is cognitive and the psychomotor skills are uh, tested. Cognitive means the knowledge yeah. part. Psychomotor means the methodology. That is sometimes these different steps is required. Steps are asked to mention whether it is uh, uh, like the measurement, the true measurement or the uh, the entry address test, what are the different steps, uh, write it down one by one like that. So these are the basically test of the psychomotor skill. And lastly, the affective skill, sometimes it is also, it is added like the, like the counseling, and because it is extremely important is going to uh, daily day by day uh, for, uh, for the management of the patients and the medical legal purpose. Now, what is the tips? Now, just I'm going just tips uh, for the, for the students. So that is, we have to read, there is some uh, some problem statement always given in the in its OSCE. So always read it properly. That is one. Second is they allow two to three minutes for the understanding because uh, the OSCE basically most of the OSCE they are given ten uh, marks and ten minutes. Ten minutes for the ten. Have we lost sound? Yes, sir. Right now, I think I'll call, sir. Okay. So, uh, is the screen is visible? Yes, sir. Now it is visible. Sir. Okay. So, so we have first we have to read the hint from the problem statement. So we have to allot the two to three minutes for understanding, and then we have to go for the diagnosis and the differential diagnosis. Next, before writing, we have to check the breakage of the marks, which will give the hints that how many answer is uh, is asked about, and uh, depending on the time, you have to answer in brief. This is most important. So we are uh, going to work <clears throat> directly in the hospital. So this is a three, 13 years old boy that is presented with uh, some limping. It is a painless limping since childhood, now presented with the anterior knee pain for last eight months. So see, so this is the problem statement. So it's a painless limping for last uh, uh, since childhood. That means a long duration. So that may be a congenital uh, problem. So there is not a uh, acquired problem. This is most important. Now the patient is complaining of the pain. That means secondary de deformity or secondary problems has developed. So now uh, see the check, check the, the range of motion as you can see here. Now the question is what is the deformity? So what is the abnormality? See the, the, which um, uh, movement is being checked? See this is the, basically it is the, this is the internal rotational movement as you can see here. So what is the basic, basic abnormality? This is asked. Now name a common cause. That is professional diagnosis as you can see here. See this is basically, uh, so this is the increased internal rotation of the right hip, as you can see here, right hip. So what is the common cause? Common is the increased antiversion of the femoral neck. So it's a common provisional diagnosis. Next, which gait abnormality do you expect? That is the into gait. Now mention the clinical test in favor of your provisional diagnosis. So all of you, so this say if you if you miss the first problem first, so then everything will become uh, lost. So if you, because there's a, instead of internal rotation, if you consider it's external rotation, then everything will become lost. So it is a clinical test. Now it is very easy to understand that it is a Craig's test. Okay. Now, now there are several questions may be asked. Give the steps of the Craig's test. 
Now, uh, in which side will you stand for the spread test? There is the opposite side. That is the side which is tested. That you have to stand. The examiner should stand on the opposite side. The next press, they press your hand first, uh, first on the sacrum, then uh, uh, on the, your thumb on the sacrum, and your hand, your both the uh, uh, all the uh, caudal or the, the cranial hands, the fingers of the cranials on the greater trochanter. Now, with your caudal hand, you have to move the limb to check whether the uh, the, the in which uh, uh, which range of motion it becomes greater trochanter becomes prominent. So these are the steps. Uh, maybe maybe asked in this uh, in these sort of uh, questions. Now, um, write exact prescription of the two special investigation for confirmation of the diagnosis beside the routine radiograph. So, uh, write properly. And so, there are two questions to, uh, to answer is, uh, is asked here. So, first is a routine radiograph apart from routine radiograph. That means, as, a, as it is an increased antiversion, increased antiversion of femoral neck, now the patient is complaining of the anterior knee pain. So, what is happening? That means there is some knee instability of the knee alignment of the knee is changed and that it leads to some uh, patellofemoral malalignment and that can lead to some secondary uh, deformity, secondary uh, deformity that is the external rotational deformity to correct uh, the, the, uh, the increased internal rotation. So basically these increased antiversion, if it is secondarily, uh, it is it is nature is trying to correct by the external rotation deformity of the, of the uh, distal part of the tibia to correct this uh, development of anterior knee pain that is known as the mal that is a miserable mal alignment syndrome and in that case so we have to ask to ask the patient to make a specific uh, radiograph that is a standing orthorangenogram with the patella facing forward uh, to so so in that case if the patella is facing forward then the, 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 by noting the alignment of the foot we can easily understand whether the foot is externally rotated or internally rotated, I am going to show it. Why, why, why do you mean? And the next another investigation is easy. That is the CT scanogram. CT scanogram to check the femoral anti uh, in femoral antiversion. Now, right to pathological condition behind this, it may be uh, physiological or idiopathic or it may be pathological. So uh, the basic uh, knowledge is sometimes it is asked up to how many age it is being corrected so it does say if it is a um, it is a not pathological that means it may be idiopathic and maybe uh, it idiopathic uh, increase antiversion that may be corrected within due course of time up to 10 to 12 years but if it crosses the 12 years then it is very very difficult to become corrected otherwise if it is a pathological conditions like the ddh or cerebral palsy that can lead to become we have to correct it otherwise there is a uh, problem of the art uh, the uh, the 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 uh, the joint prop the, uh, the articular degeneration. Now uh, mention the possible treatment option with the explanation. So I have already told there is a, as there is a increased antiversion, there is a uh, there is intoing that is internal rotational deformity of the femur, and that leads to patellar malalignment. That can be uh, natural nature to try to correct it by the external tibial torsion. So spontaneous correction is possible up to 10 to 12 years age. As the patient is 12 years old with anterior knee pain, so supracondylar corrective rotational uh, osteotomy is the surgical treatment of the choice in this case. So if it is a mal, uh, miserable malalignment syndrome, uh, that is known as a MMS, so that uh, in that case, that is easily uh, diagnosed by this method. So how to take this uh, standing orthorangenogram as you can see here. So if the patient will stand like this, this is not, this is a faulty technique. So you can see here, the patella is not facing forward. It is in, it is, uh, it is almost a kissing patella. So this is very difficult to diagnose. But if the patient is standing with the patella facing forward, then the, what will happen? If there is an external rotation deformity, the foot will uh, look, uh, foot will go like this. So that uh, in the upper part, it will look like the anteroposterior view. In the lower part of the tibia, that will look like the lateral view. And the whole foot will, look, will, will be, uh, will be the, the, means the lateral view of the whole foot you give you easily visible. So that is the taste by which we can easily understand whether it is a compensated or it is a primary deformity. Okay, and, and as you can see here, uh, this uh, in that uh, in that case, this is not a this is not a uh, miserable malignment. But uh, see th this this case, you can see here. See if the patella is facing forward, there is there is a uh, there is like external rotational deformity, and the almost uh, part of the foot is externally rotated, and that is attempted to correct it with the help of this uh, that is um, uh, rotational osteotomy, supracondylar rotational osteotomy. Now, this is another case. It is a five years old boy presented with painless limping for last three years. 
last three years, so five years, last three years. That means almost it starts from the working age. So uh, now what are the, uh, uh, so from the problem statement, you have to understand what is the cause of painless limping within zero to five years of age. So what are the, uh, cause? all of you know, if the five to 10 for the commonest cause is the parthis. If it is less than five, so it is it, it is not a case of parthis. So what are the common cause? So see, the, that is why it is also mentioned two specific points relevant from the history of the diagnosis. So, uh, so we have to find out which is the cause. First cause is, the, is basically it is a unstable hip that is a post, post septic unstable. That means the septic arthritis or Thompson arthritis, where the pro proximal part of the femur is, uh, is absent, it is becomes uh, damaged and ultimately that is a void is created and because of the void, because it's unstable and that is leads to this sort of uh, painless limb ultimately becomes painful in the in the long run uh, so this first one is is the is a post septic uh, uh, unstable hip another is basically maybe due to the congenital deficiency of the femur or the tibia so congenital uh, developmental dysplasia or any any congenital deformity or that the, there is a deficiency of the femur or the tibia so these two uh, point so mentioned two specific points relevance from the history this is asked for from so see as you can see, it is the deformity of the trunk. As you can see here, the trunk and the limb distance, it is increased on this case. And see the lower limb. Right? The lower limb in the affected side, as it, it is, it may be affected on the as a painless limping. If it is the left side is if it is affected, then they see it is straight. On the right side, it is flexed. So it, it is it is basically it does appears to become flexed. The right lower limb appears to become flexed at the hip and the knee. That means there is a possibility of limb length discrepancy. So mark two findings on inspection. These two findings on the inspection history. From history, we have to take the diagnosis. That is, that means is there a history of uh, discharge of the pass or operation in the neonate or infantile period, and or there is a patient is complaining of limping without this this sort of history from the very beginning. So that is the congenital uh, shortening or the limb length uh, congenital uh, femoral deficiency or the tibial deficiency. Now, these two findings, it, it is the, it may be the uh, trunk deformity, it may be uh, either list or the scoliosis and the lower limb, the right lower limb appears to become flexed at the hip and the knee, these two findings. Now, mention any simple clinical test to check the nature of the trunk deformity. So, all of, the, all of you know, this trunk deformity it may be either a scoliosis or it may be list. So, how to uh, differentiate? Just ask the patient to sit on a stool or uh, bend forward. So if it the obliterates completely, then it is it is not a scoliosis. It is not a structural scoliosis. Basically, it is a it is a, it is a it is a compensatory scoliosis due to shortening of the left lower limb. Okay. Now mention the special clinical test to check the hip in this case. So which uh, which uh, specific test will you do if there is an unstable hip? Then all of you know this is a telescopic test. So this you can do this uh, classical telescopic test you can do. So this is the answer. With explanation, that means we already I explained why the telescopic test is required in such a patient with a painless limb, which is limping for last three years. Now there is a, a two common clinical diagnosis I already mentioned that, that that has to be thought from the very beginning. And now we have to write it down. That may not be asked, but if it has it is asked, you can write it down. Now what are the exact prescription of investigation for diagnosis of above two condition? So the, all, of, all the points are discussed, history of high fever, discharge of pass, painless limitation of the hip motions in neonatal period of the infancy, required surgical intervention, suggested septic arthritis, storm smith variety, asymptomatic painless limping, since the baby learned walking, congenital short femur, focal femoral deficiency. Now scoliosis or tilt, right lower limb appears to become flexed, the inspected finding, ask the baby to lean forward or sit, uh, to see the, as the patient sits, is completely obliterated. So it is a compensatory uh, to, uh, secondary to uh, the limb length discrepancy. Now, telescopic test for Thompson arthritis for absorption of femoral head already discussed. Now, the, what is the exact prescription? This is very important. Now, we have to write it down the straight radiograph of pelvis, including both the hip AP and the lateral view of the left hip. This is a tom for Thompson with arthritis. And the congenital femoral tibial deficiency, you have to write it down the standing orthorangenogram of the hip knee ankle, both side anteroposter view. So, see if somebody writes down the, uh, the x ray of the femur, including hip and the knee. So that will, that is a, it's a faulty answer. The patient will, uh, the student will get zero mark. Because how to uh, com, com, compare 
unless you compare on the other side, you cannot make it, it is, it is not possible for diagnosis of the short femur. So that is very extremely important for comparison. So that is the basic, that is the exact, uh, that is why exact radiological prescription is asked for this. So this is the prescription, okay? So um, now uh, this is another case. There is a, a 55 years old man presented with inability to grip for six months following a major elbow surgery. So major elbow surgery following which the inability to grip. So, so as you can see here, so this is uh, this is the uh, uh, technique and sometimes the uh, the video is also given. So you have to check it. So which sort of uh, um, orthosis we have used this. So I, the, the question is identify the orthosis and the disease uh, for which it is commonly used. So see, this is a knuckle bender splint. So it is most commonly used for the, uh, so what would be the answer? Can anybody uh, tell it? Can anybody, it's very easy. So what would be the answer? So basically, yes. Yes. see, yeah. this is the answer. That you're, you will get the half marks because as you can see here, the, all the all the fingers, all the fingers are kept flexed and there is a pad on the behind. So you have your answer will be total claw hand, total claw hand, total that means ulnar and median both. So if you write in down the ulnar claw hand, that will get the half marks. Okay. Next another question is enumerate the primary and the secondary functional deficit. So if it is a basically it is an intrinsic minor sign. So in the intrinsic minor sign, what is the primary functional deficit? What is the primary problem? Primary problem is the loss of uh, loss of flexion of the metacarpophalangeal joint, okay? So basically, that is the function of the intrinsic muscles. That is the primary function is the loss of flexion of the metacarpophalangeal. This is the primary function. And the secondary function is, once there is a loss of metacarpophalangeal flexion, the extensor on the opposite side, they take the upper hand. They causes the, they try to hyperextend the metacarpophalangeal joint. As there is a hyperextension of the, uh, the there is a the tendency of hyperextension of the metacarpophalangeal joint, there is a tenodicing effect on the opposite side. There is a long flexure tendency, and the long flexure tendency because of the tenodicing effect, there is a flexion deformity. Flexion deformity. So that is the problem. The secondary problem is the hyperextension of the MP MCP, and there is a there is a flexion of the uh, IP joint. The secondary function deficit. Now describe the mechanism of the action of this orthosis. So the, in this question, see this number is, you see this is the four marks. So that means there are some, there's some division of the marks is not done. That means there are two questions, two uh, answer is, it is divided. That means mechanism of this orthosis. That means what is the function of the orthosis in a, in a nerve injury case? That is the one. And what is the role of this orthosis in this nerve case? So these are two the question is, inside that uh, question so first question is what is the what is the role of orthosis in any nerve injury that means it maintains the minimal muscle length till its recovery so once it is recovered but if the muscle is kept stretched that means maximum length is preserved so if there's a maximum length then the, the one does not try not, uh, just starts uh, regeneration regenerating then it, the, there's uh, that weak signals is very incapable to contract the longer length of the muscles. That is why the muscle is required to be kept in a so shorter length. So that is the function of any orthotic, any orthosis in nerve injury. Now they see this is the, this uh, uh, orthosis is based not a, a static orthosis, it is a dynamic orthosis. That is why it is dynamic. See, they, these are the, 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 the movement, some movement is allowed. And not only that, some rubber bands, rubber bands are attached over this. And the next question is given here. They mention the function of the utility of the rubber band attached, uh, that is yellow arrow here. So what is the utility? So how is next function? Next function of this the particular, this orthosis is the dynamic orthosis. And in any dynamic orthosis like the dynamic cocker splint, the answer is the same. That means, so that you see, this is a knuckle bender splint, total ulnar claw hand, primary is loss of, as is already given. But this is very important. I just trying to highlight is, the how it, uh, the, what is the uh, dynamism? Dynamism keep the motor end plate alive. How it, uh, it is possible? There is a, that possible by two uh, mechanism. That is the agonist antagonist synergism and the reciprocal innovation. What is that? 
agonist antagonist synergism is basically so that means if i want to uh, dorsiflex the wrist the so dorsiflexion of the wrist is only possible if the palmar flexion of the wrist is palmar flexures becomes relaxed so the contraction of the dorsiflexures of the wrist is 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 almost uh, uh, is possible only when it is executed once there is a relaxation of the plantar flexion of the wrist is possible so basically so contraction of the dorsiflexures and and the relaxation of the plantar flexures both are the active process so basically this is the uh, this is the agonist antagonist that means the, if there is agonist uh, try to contract that electric stimulation goes on the opposite side and then that that gives the signal to the opposite side to uh, to make it relaxed otherwise that function will not become possible so that is the the, the principle is the agonist antagonist synergism and the same same uh, synergism is also used for the dynamic coca splint also so another is the reciprocal innervation that means that is the electrical stimulus which is which is generated in in the active process in this contraction side that goes on the opposite side that there is antagonist side to make it uh, excited so that that becomes an active relaxation so that is known as the reciprocal innervation so what is happening here this rubber band so that there actually is because of the rubber band and because of the dynamism once the patient the patients will be able to extend the metacarpalar joint with the help of the extensor digitorum which is supplied by the radial nerve so once the radial nerve is it is used for extension of the mcp joint so that stimulus that goes on the opposite side uh, that is the uh, that is on the flexor side to uh, stimulate the motor and plate of the of the muscles which are innervated by the ulnar and the median nerve and that is a natural electrophysiological treatment nature tries to tra treat it uh, so that is uh, that will help to keep the motor and plate alive so that is the you know that is the principle is known as the agonist antagonist synergism and the law of reciprocal innovation so these are the two you can use in any in any any uh, splint which is a dynamic splint now, so rubber band it helps the extension of the fingers it is supplied by the uh, the, the prostate uh, the uh, interosseous nerve extensor digitorum that will strengthen that muscles at the same time uh, so uh, again that uh, they causes the passive flexion and that uh, they follow the agonist antagonist synergism and reciprocal innervation now so it is another case it is 16 year old 16 year old boy presented with untreated deformity of the foot see in this case so there is untreated 16 years so uh, there is one important point i just want to highlight the uh, technically don't use the term neglected so uh, the, there are two terms and now it is become being going to a band that is a there is neglected ctv like that neglected injury who neglected so there is several medical legal points so don't try to uh, make make it whether neglected you have to treat it to write it untreated it is a universal uh, phenomenon is going on everywhere another is road traffic accident again it is being changed that is a road traffic injury so accident again it is it is a medical legal term you should not use that there's some much more litigation can happen so you have to use a road traffic injury so similarly this is an untreated case now the first question is identify the deformities with the location of the origin so it is a first question asked in every short cases on the ctv so say there's a cave all of you know there is a cavus there is a but this is the most important point is here it is it is asked the location of origin so that means suppose the equinus we have to mention equinus at where equinus at the and there is an ankle joint there is a tibiotalar joint similarly varus where varus it is basically the subtalar joint some again varus it is it is in the talonavicular joint okay next again is a, it is adduction that is a, uh, that is adduction is, is a it is basically the talonavicular and the calcinicubar joint there is another deformity is it is there apart from the uh, the cavus cavus why it is cavus cavus it is basically at the dropping of the first metatarsal so basically that is due to the uh, uh, dropping of the first metatarsal that is a cavus so there is a cave is a is a standard but apart from the cave there is another deformity is that uh, here it is, is seen here can anybody spot this which deformity is there anybody apart from cave that is i've already all of you know apart from there is another deformity it is it is associated with this as a long standing case this is a plantar deformity it is a plantar deformity that is the that is see this is the there is a plantar flexion at the tarsometatarsal joint 
plantar flexion and the tarsus. This is a plantaris deformity. So if you write it, it, it is the cave that is a four deformity, you will get the full marks. And it is not asked here, but it may be asked and you can have to add this. Now, the next question is, suggest the etiology of the disease with explanation. So etiology of the disease. So there are the, once the etiology is disease, it, that may be, it may be neurogenic, it may be musculogenic, it may be, uh, it may be idiopathic, it may be uh, uh, osteogenic. But uh, seeing this photograph, is it possible to uh, suggest the etiology? Can anybody, anybody try it? Is the important finding is given in this photograph. Anybody try, can try. Avinas? Yes. Uh, I think, uh, pardon? Please, uh, pardon? Yeah. Uh, can sir. you please? Yeah, yes. Yes, Avinas. Sir, uh, idiopathic. Pardon? No, no. Sir. What? No, see, this is the drop toe sign. Of end. Yeah, yes. See, see, this drop toe sign. You can see here. Toe yes, is sir. below the level of the second toe. It is a drop toe sign. It is not an idiopathic variety. If there is a drop toe sign, that means the great toe is plantar flex. That can be that can't be dorsiflex actively, but passive dorsiflexion is possible. That has to be tested. So that is a that indicates it's a neurogenic variety. Okay. Now mention the two important points for counseling before treatment. See this most so this is the affected domain. So uh, how would counsel? Mention the role of the conservative treatment. Is there any role of conservative no, with explanation? And select two the surgical treatment options. Now I'm going one by one. Now the aim of this such treatment is you have to have some plantigrade food. You have to suckle as much as possible. You have to go painless as much as possible. Functional as much as possible. But the problem is, as it is a it is a very uh, old old uh, 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 patient, sixteen years. There are several secondary deformities developed in the uh, sub tissues and the ligaments, capsules, and the bones. So it is very difficult to correct the functional. So counsel to have the food have to be done. That means that food can be made plantigrade that by surgery, but may not be supple or may become stiff after surgery. Okay, this, these are the points to be counseled. Now the options, the conservative role of conservative. Yes, sponsory techniques always perform. Always, always perform a sponsory technique because you have to you have to see the supination, which makes some abduction. Uh, so always perform some uh, some some amount of abduction, uh, abduction of the forefoot. If it is possible, then that makes the tissue much more pliable. Less surgical correction is possible. Surgery, it's always, always it is a multiple uh, osteotomy, arthrodesis, the followed by the tendon transfer and the breast protocol. Somebody may try the Elizara, that is a V cut or the U cut or the lazy C cut like that, osteotomy gradual correction or with or without orthodesis followed by the breast protocol. So these are the points. Now the another case is the third in your some, 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 some sometimes the radiograph is used uh, for the for this. So 39 years male presented with this four weeks duration. So identify the fracture. Can anybody try to identify? Sir, olicron fracture. Is it anybody? Only olicron? Just treat complete x-ray. Yeah. Pardon? Yes, Avinas? Yes, sir. Yes, it is someone has raised here. Yeah. X-ray of uh, matured skeleton uh, yeah, showing... Yeah. Yes, yes, yes try. elbow joint uh, with uh, a lycron fracture and uh, uh, anterior uh, dislocation of the elbow. Very good. So basically, mm. is it trauma? Sir, so, uh, Rohit has raised his hand. Yes, Rohit. Yes, Rohit. You can. Rohit. Rohit. So, uh, so this is skygram showing anteroposterior view and lateral view of uh, elbow joint, uh, including distal humerus and Radius and ulna showing fracture of olecranon with anterior dislocation uh, and a coronoid and coronoid fracture. Absolutely. So there is a trans olecranon fracture dislocation. Uh, is proximal. it uh, terrible triad? No. No. See, terrible triad is different. Terrible triad, you can see this. It is intact. Radial head is intact, but this is a trans olecranon fracture dislocation. Okay. Now, uh, see, so, this is uh, the terrible triad is a very clear uh, injury where you have a dislocation of the elbow which is unstable 
but the injuries that you have in that are that are included in that are a radial head fracture a coronoid fracture and a posterior dislocation of the elbow uh, usually the lateral ulnar collateral ligament is always gone and the medial collateral ligament may also be gone so it's a very unstable injury but it's more ligamentous than body this is basically mainly a bony injury okay so yes. the entire you have a fracture through the olecranon and the entire a distal fragment along with the radial head dislocates anteriorly so once you reduce it it becomes quite stable unlike in a terrible trad injury so you have to have a clear concept of the two injuries absolutely so so next question is mention the differential diagnosis with explanation can anybody try this i think uh, we can ask some someone else if you yes yes please yes, subhansu you can explain so what is the montegia fracture can anybody tell montegia fracture yes type 4 montegia yes so the differential diagnosis is which type of montegia it is type 4 sir it's not a type 4 montegia because if you know what a type 4 montegia is it's a fracture of the radius and ulna with a radial head dislocation so Absolutely. these would come under the group of injuries you call montegia variants equivalent or equivalent yes. not uh, it's not so, uh, one of the classical is... four groups of montegia fractures absolutely so if, if you could tell that is a type 1 montegia so which will come in a differential diagnosis but it is not a type 1 so what is the point so type 1 montegia means that is a fracture of the proximal ulna and anterior dislocation of the radial head that is it so type 1 montegia that could be but, but it is not a type 1 montegia but by as, as there is some important radiological hint is there can anybody point out that hint so myositis ossificans no 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 that is a separate that is a separate see by noting the injury pattern so can it be a type 1 montegia fracture is a dislocation or not or in the sense that question directly may come how will you differentiate the transolecranon fracture uh, dislocation differs from the uh, bad type 1 montegia fracture dislocation so if you look at the x ray very carefully what do you see is the proximal yes, ulna and the radial head going together or absolutely. is it yeah absolutely the relationship see the proximal relationship of the radius and superior radial ulna joint so basically the bado when he highlighted the classification so it didn't highlight the relationship it is extremely important see the relationship it is it is it is there in uh, in uh, montegia fracture dislocation that relationship may or may not be uh, disrupted see if there is a dislocation of the radial head there is a possibility of proximal radial ulna joint dislocation but here the, the the relationship is maintained so the there is no dislocation of the superior radial ulna joint there is dislocation of the that is humeral ulna joint isn't it so this is this cannot be a montegia fracture dislocation so that is it that is why it is a transolecranon fracture dislocation understand now come to the point which now has maximum probability of the injury can anybody take see this is a very easy question posterior interosseous nerve posterior interosseous nerve see so see this is anterior it is going anterior yes neeraj so all the anterior structures becomes relaxed and the posterior structures becomes stretched yeah i think somebody else like neeraj or yeah, i'm going to hit i'm going is, to hit yeah. so any any this this sort of question may be asked suppose it is a displaced supracondylar fracture yeah. or in a dislocation and then a posterior dislocation posteromedial dislocation or posterolateral yeah, dislocation no. yes rohit no. uh, no. yes very good see the Allah. posterior structures may be uh, may be stretched and that is the ulnar nerve may be injured now the name is special uh, now which is uh, name is special investigation with reason can anybody tell special investigation with reason i think kaka is, is answering here yeah. kaka dr kaka is here you can answer unmute yourself and answer yes please so we have Sir. one answer. Yes. sir M mri uh, why mri out, yes they are give the reason sir uh, ligamentous injury to rule out ligamentous injury to see uh, what sir, ligament 
Yes, sir. John Mukhopadhyay just uh, just uh, two minutes back he uh, highlighted that this is not a uh, ligamentous injury. Ligamentous injury is basically he occurs in the in the, the triple triad. Tri 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 sir, uh, okay, we have see, this, the relationship is sir, maintained. We have this. two answers in the chat box. Doctor Adi has written nerve velocity study and Doctor Kaka has written three D CT scan. Yes. So which one? Yes, of the, the among the two, one is correct. Among the yeah. two, one is correct. See, the nerve injury is easily detected by the clinical methods, but not the radio, the, the articular configuration, isn't it? See, what is the most important structures damaged over here? That is a trochlear nerve. And trochlear nerve is extremely important for uh, generating the post-operative recovery of the functional results. So that is most important. That can only be seen with the help of the uh, CT scan. That is the 3D CT scan. This is the uh, absolute answer. Now, the next question is, suggest the best surgical option for the uh, optimum functional recovery. So, already you have got the hint. So, I'm not uh, just without wastage of time. I'm just uh, uh, in. So, that is the anatomical restoration of the trochlear notch by rigid and absolute the internal fixation. Okay. So, that is the answer. And as John uh, Mukhavada rightly highlighted, see, there is a uh, no... Uh, uh, ligamentous laxity in this case so there so if you know the subject you can easily understand it is just uh, fixation of the radar is, is sufficient enough and otherwise you have to uh, you have to explore it and then in a terrible triad you have to the, the most important you have to check the postlateral ligament and after that uh, also on the medial side also now see this uh, this diagnosis this is a 19 years old female uh, this is present with yes. traumatic yes. paraplegia uh, traumatic paraplegia of three weeks duration. Okay, this is a traumatic paraplegia of three weeks duration. Now see what is happening. Reward signs. Yes, absolutely right. So clinically, the, what to identify the clinical sign is a before sign. Before now mention the steps. Yes, absolutely right. Now mention the steps of elicitation of the test. Can anybody try to do that? Steps of elicitation as the patient is doing, is it correct? Uh, no, sir. Sir, we yes. stroke the, the stroke the with medial to laterally and see the movement of oblicus. Without no, no, stroking, you can do it or not. Yeah. Stroke will do or not? Will stroke or not? See, they are, they see there are four, four one. That means there are four steps is required. So the, the supine position with exposure, that is the one. Keep the hands across the chest. Attempt to get up by forward flexion of the neck. Attempt to get up by forward flexion of the neck. This is most important. Now, if the patient, if there is a catch. If the, if the uh, spine is unstable, see what the patient is doing. As the patient is, is the spine is, remains unstable, then it is very difficult to do this test and in that case, we have to do, uh, we have to uh, keep your forearm, keep your hand on the forearm and ask the patient to elevate the head, but patient will not elevate. But on an attempt of doing that, there is a movement of the, uh, sorry. Sorry, you have to. Uh, uh, so, just a minute, I have to close it and I have to again. Yes. Just a minute. Yeah, by the time, if anybody uh, has some doubt, you can ask. Any, right any, any uh, yes. Any, 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 any questions? Sir, I'm not able to understand tenodesis effects. Tenodesis, yes. Tenodesis effect is that means once there is a uh, there is a loss of uh, there is a flexion of the MCP joints. So there is a, uh, there, the just opposite muscles, opposite muscles are basically, they are taking the upper hand, okay? Uh, opposite muscle means that is the extensor digitorum. They are doing the, the extension of the metacorphalangeal joint, okay? And uh, the, that is supplied by the radial now. And once there is a, that causes hyperextension of the metacorphalangeal joint. And then there's a hyperextension. There is a tenodesing effect on the other side. That is a, the, the, the other side means the flexor side. The flexors are trying to flex it. Okay. So uh, that is the tenodesing effect. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. 
ओके जस्ट मिनट आई थिंक व्हाट सर वाज आस्ट लाइक दैट मोंटेजिया टाइप 1 so anybody know the classification of montagia type 1 you understood that bad 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 classification yeah what is type 1 type 1 is a fracture as the uh, uh, ulnar metaphysis with anterior dislocation of radial head and what is type 4 type 4 is sir uh, how it is different this, from type 1 sir there is a elbow dislocation also elbow dislocation so type 4 is uh, we just radial, discussed it huh? ulna, both fractures in type 4 yeah. and uh, yes, sir, uh, sir fracture same level with uh, radial, radial entered anterolateral dislocation of radial head yes avinas you are telling yeah sir uh, in type 1 there is only ulna fractures proximal ulna fracture with anterior radial uh, dislocation and in type 4 there is both radius and ulna fracture with the radial head dislocation so in the type 4 they it actually doesn't say which way it is dislocated is dislocated so it could depend be you can have lateral medial a lateral posterior or anterior dislocation of the radial head but you yes. also have a radial fracture with it okay yes yes uh, so is next it, question is uh, is it my uh, slide is visible no Yes, sir. Yeah. The next question is interpret the results. Ah, uh, now mention the clinical condition where it is difficult to interpret. That is the obese patient. If it is obese patient, then it is very difficult to understand in which side it is going up, up or down, or like that. Then so, uh, what is the inter interpretation? Is it is a it is going up, isn't it? So interpret the results of the test showing its clinical significance. It means abnormal as the now umbilicus is moving upwards. That indicates there is a paralysis of the lower rectus. the spinal lesion is d789 and the cord lesion is d10 and 12 so this is the inference now this is another question it's a 23 years old man footballer that is it is a basically it's a defender he has sudden onset pain of the left ring finger and inability to grip following the attempt of to restrain the opposite opponent striker okay and then see there is a there is inability to grip and the finger is looking like that So identify the deformity. Can anybody tell the deformity of the injury? Jersey fingers. Finger. Very, very good. So this is jersey fingers. So this is very common. Now mention the injured structure and the place of the injury. Uh, what you will write down? Fracture is termed profundus injury. Uh, yes, there is a one. See, there is a one plus one. It is Greek. See, that is why it is oski. That means this is the essence of oski. That means if you write it down, fracture is termed profundus. You will get one marks among the two. Function of the. Uh, sir ligament of injury place of injury that means where base of distal phalanx that yes, means sir. yes that means the zone one zone one the digit from injury now why ring finger is affected here why not other fingers ring finger is commonly affected because it is it is stabilized there is there, uh, there is no no have to go in ring finger cannot go anywhere because it is extremely stabilized with the help of the bipinnate lumbricals when it is going to be flexed it is extremely flexed it is rigid with the help of the bipinnate lumbrical so in that uh, so basically it, it, this this is the injury occurs when there is a forceful hyper extension uh, against the active flexion of the finger so Uh, as the ring finger is or is uh, there is a bipinnate uh, lumbricus, so it is commonly injured. Now, now mention the two surgical options. Mean two mention two investigations for confirmation of the diagnosis. Now, which investigation will you offer, sir? X-ray and MRI. X-ray for what? Give the uh, reason. X-ray. Either emulsion fragments, sir. Yes, there is a bony jersey finger. And it is a cartilaginous jersey about the tissue jersey finger. Then in that case, we have to do the MRI or, or in other sense. Yes, you are right. But very cheap investigation is already there. That is the ultrasonography. Yes, okay? sir. Ultrasound. Yes, ultrasound is very easy. And in ultra, what is the advantage of the ultrasound? And which type of ultrasound? Can any can anybody tell? Is there any any uh, the, the same ultrasound machine which is used for the uh, baby position in gynecology? Or the ultrasound is different in our orthopedics. 
हाई रेजोल्यूशन हाई रेजोल्यूशन हाई फ्रीक्वेंसी और हाई रेजोल्यूशन हाई फ्रीक्वेंसी अल्ट्रासाउंड so yes, that is very extremely important to uh, to identify not only the site of the injury but also the the retraction how much uh, the the uh, the cut end is retracted away so that is the two point that is easily so mri cannot detect cannot tell exactly how much it is where it is there but uh, even during the operation also you can identify suppose the mri can tell that sir it is it is 2 cm uh, retracted but uh, the, you have uh, that mri is 2 weeks old now it is further retracted so it is very difficult to identify so this sort of usg is very important for diagnosis exactly during just before operation or of the uh, par operative uh, location of the exact uh, area where it is retracted because depending on that we have to there are two surgical options can anybody tell two surgical options the direct tendon repair and yes open reduction and depending on the retraction area if it is more than 1 cm or less than 1 cm if it is less than 1 cm it is direct repair if it is more than 1 cm we have to reconstruct it now yes. select the splint after reconstruction which type of splint to be used basically it is a dorsal block splint you have to used and last question is mention the time to return to sports that is a 12 weeks okay now this is another case yes sir excuse me yes. sir yes. sir may we take a few questions now yes, so that please. Uh, yes. Yes, sir. So, can you if uh, use the slide so then? Which one? Can, uh, this question. This one. Yes, sir. No, not this question, sir. From the participants, what are the okay. difficulties and all okay. that? Yes, please. During the ASCII, so that because we have ten more minutes for yes, please, the meeting, please. sir. Yes, please. Yes, sir. So I, I think to, I have to stop share. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. So. so Uh, if anybody have uh, some doubts about oski you can ask right now because i think uh, the now the marks is reduced to 100 sir probably yes for the oski yes it was 150 marks uh, i think one year back yeah, yeah now, now it, it is 100 yes yes sir so it's still six marks question for each one sir or it's something different no, because is, no it, so we have to become prepared that is i have already uh, uh, mentioned in the past you have to check how much mark is allotted sometimes it is 10 marks uh, 10 minutes uh, it may be 6 minutes 6 uh, 6 marks okay yes, so sir. that is we have to check it so uh, there is a possibility every possibility so it is 100 yes, marks the uh, that means that i think it may be either 10 into 10 or if it is 6 that means it will be difficult to differentiate Okay, so you have to become very prepared for that. You have to check yes. how much marks is allotted. So it is five marks for each question and four minute allotted for each question, uh, followed by one minute break. So yeah. That may be that may be the sequence. Sequence. Yes. That's why I am telling we have to become very much aware how much marks is allotted for that. Is there is a division of the mark and then the time allotted for that? Okay. Yes. So for each question, how? How many minutes, Avinash? If you have any idea, four minutes. Four minutes for five marks. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so that twenty questions. Yes, sir. Twenty questions. Twenty questions. Four marks. So, yes. Yeah. So you are a very. Someone. Yeah. Yes, sir. Please. If if the, if the question ask about the step of examination. Yes, okay, sir. How can we? <laughs> we can we are, we we usually do examination but we can uh, some books are there sir for that step wise examination yes yes per perfectly where to keep hand and where to, yes. in brief sir so, suppose yes i have already i am shown it there is there is a some steps are asked sometimes the marks are divided so if the marks are divided 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus that means four steps are required if there is no no division of mark is there that means we have to uh, you have to mark it every steps as they have got the five minutes then you can write suppose uh, if the question is write down the, uh, the the steps of examination of the true length measurement of the lower limb okay so that can be helped. so we have to ask we have to st uh, start with that you have to take the consent you have to understand what are going to become uh the happen in the following minutes and then you have to take the uh, have to give some uh, adequate uh, exposure so these are the common next that is the position of the patient so position of the supine then we have to always examine the uh, measurement in supine position 
So they have the supine position, you know, on a hard surface. That's it. That is to be right everywhere. They have been well illuminated area. Spine should be stretched. Limbs should be as as parallel as possible um, with each other. This is the second step. Third one, we have to check the squaring of the pelvis. Uh, the squaring, whether squaring is it is it is done or not. If it's not done, we have to square the pelvis first. Then we have to check the normal side also first. We have to check the segmental length. Then come to the affected side. We have to make an identical position of the uh, affected limb. Then you have to like the segmental limb. So these are the steps. Uh, you have to write it down. So I'm giving the example like that. So in any questions you have asked like the steps, if there is a uh, division is already there, you have to make it that there's uh, steps are required. Otherwise, you have to get, uh, write it down every steps. Yes. yes. So... Uh... I think uh, he has also asked about which book he should read for clinical examination. I think, uh, Amil? See, because... that is, there is no, it's unfortunately, there is yes. no consensus of, of these steps. It is any, any, there is no consensus book uh, where it's written that these are the usual steps. But that you have, if you read all the, the, the leading books like the Ace Dash, the Hoppenfeld, uh, the, the, the Suresh Pandey, and they have every the clinical books, even the Macri. Macri is also a very good uh, clinical book. Uh, Adams also there. Uh, so it's in that case, you can easily understand. And that is why we are doing the different PG courses also across the country for making it a consensus. So that uh, the, the, there'll be uh, uh, white, that like a white paper. And uh, with the, our intention was uh, just to, after the uh, completion of this course, there is another partner course. Just we have completed the Kolkata Patna collaboration upper limb course. And now in the September, we are going to perform the another course that is a Kolkata Patna collaborated lower limb course. So in the, after that, uh, our, uh, our uh, uh, try, we will try to make a white paper like that. So depending on the uh, requirement of the students. So that will be very good for the uh, student also. Yeah, except that the, our courses are going to be mainly on fractures. It's not going to take every pathology at the moment. We could do those later, maybe. Absolutely. I think, sir. Uh, okay, great. Just, yeah, just one question, sir. Like, uh, for the spine examination, what yeah. is uh, most common you find the, the student is not performing well in which part? Usually, sir, common things which you find in almost everyone so that that should not be missed, the basic thing. Which are the common things we should yes. not be should not be missed. Yes. See, so what he is asking is what are the things that the people usually get wrong? The candidates usually get wrong when it comes to yes. examining the spine. That is a very very vast subject, and, and yeah. already we are it's running too big a question. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe uh, we will take that in some spine. I am requesting yeah. uh, Janki to make another uh, program on the common mistakes on <laughs> spine examination. Yeah. Okay. I will have to discuss on that. It's like okay, a whole sure, day's sure. topic. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you, sir. We so, will have. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, that brings us to the end of this webinar. Uh, uh, till we meet again next week. So, bye, everybody, and have a bye. Great time in the meanwhile. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, sir, sir. Dr. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Bye. Thank you, sir. We have another meeting in that one, sir. It starts. Thank you, sir. Bye. Yes.